بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. So Alhamdulillah, uh, we're on our tenth part of the series of the Seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khatib al-Nabiyyin, the Seer of the Prophets. And uh, last week we went over the early childhood of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he was just after he was born, a few months, could be a few weeks after he was born, when Halima Sa'diya radiallahu anha took him into the desert and she was his wet nurse, basically she nursed him and she took care of him until he was the age of two some years old, two to two and a half years old. After that she brought him back to uh, the mother and uh, Amina and she begged her basically to let him, let her keep him longer. And the reason was because of the barakah and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala she had witnessed when having Rasulullah sallam, young Muhammad sallam, with her in her in her village. And these are many barakat, any blessings that she saw, and she wanted to a continuation of that barakah. So she asked to keep him longer. And when Amina, the mother of Rasulullah sallam, agreed, she took him back, but only after a few months did she bring him back again, and that was because of the incident of Shakul Sadr. The Shakul Sadr meaning the the opening of the of the chest that occurred, and that actually f- put fear in the hearts of uh, the Halima Saadiya Radhalanha, and they were afraid that something evil is going to happen, something bad is going to happen to the Prophet Sallallahu to this young child. So they were afraid they didn't want to keep him longer and just, you know, take him back in one piece, take him back healthy and safe and sound. Uh, otherwise, they were afraid something's going to happen to him. Anyways, we learned that uh, the Shaq al-Sadr, this is something that the first occurrence when the, was the Prophet Sallallahu was around two to three years old, around that age. Uh, maybe maybe even four years old, they say two to four years old. And uh, Imam uh, Maulana Shah Abdul Aziz Mahdi Dalwi, he writes in the Tafsir Surah in Shirah, he writes that uh, according to his opinion, uh, that it occurred four times in the Prophet's life. So the first time was when he was two to four years old, when he was in the village of Banu Sa'ad. And the second time was when he was 10 years old. The third time when he was 40 years old in Ghar Hira, when the first revelation of the Qur'an was given. And then the fourth time was approximately when he was 50 years old, uh, when Isra wal Mi'raj. So two of these four we know for sure the ulama have uh, recorded. The first one is being when he was in Banu Sa'ad uh, at the young age. And uh, the second one was in Isra wal Mi'raj, before Isra wal Mi'raj took place. Uh, when he was about 50 years old, when the Prophet ﷺ was taken, the saqf, the, the roof of, his, of the house that he was in opened up and he was taken by two angels to the Hatim, to Hijar Ismail. And then at that point, that's where they laid him down and they opened up his chest and they cleaned his, his heart again. Uh, so according to different ulama, two times, some say four times, uh, di- different occurrences. But we know the, the reason behind this, the ulama say, is that the Prophet ﷺ was getting prepared for what was to come. So for example, when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was two years old or four, three years old, when the first time it happened, he was getting prepared. And like, like I said, uh, the angels took out a black spot a black part of the heart, and they said, "This is min shaitan." This is the part of the shaitan where he comes to attack. So the 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 ulama say he was purified of that, and also we know that he was his heart was t- put into a, a golden vessel, and it was cleaned with the water of zamzam and some ice, some thalj, which was ice, and they cleaned it. Uh, anyways, so. Again, the Prophet ﷺ was being prepared for what is to come. For example, the wahi, the, the, you know, the, the heaviness of that wahi that was going to be revealed to that heart. Now, going back to the Prophet ﷺ, the young Muhammad ﷺ, being a young child living in Mecca without a father, and he lived in, under the, you could say, tutelage of his grandfather, under the cust- custody of his grandfather, and his mother was there at that time, so he's returned back, back to Mecca. And as the Prophet ﷺ is growing up, one of the things that we see is that he lived a life of poverty. And this is throughout his life. The Prophet ﷺ never had a life of luxury. So even when he was young, and this is one of the things that's amazing that the Prophet ﷺ being in the house of one of the most noble families of Quraysh and being the grandson of the leader of Quraysh, 
he still was living in a life of poverty. And this teaches us a great, great lesson that Abdul Muttalib, even though he was the leader and he could have used that leadership, that power, that strength to become rich, but he refused that and he used that wealth, whatever wealth he had, whatever he earned, they actually were in living in a life of poverty because they would spend that all in, in feeding and giving the, the hajjaj to take in taking care of the hajjaj. Remember we talked about the different things, the hijaba, the hijaba was the ones who take care of the of the, the door of the Kaaba, and then you have Siqaya, which are the ones who take care of the uh, the feeding and uh, of the pilgrims. So Banu Hashim was given the duty of feeding the pilgrims. So Abdul Muttalib would take care of the pilgrims, and he would use all his spend all his wealth. They were ready to give all the wealth, whatever they earned that year, whatever they had, and they would even borrow from others to take care of the Hajjaj. That's how much honor they saw in this, and that's how much they, they loved to take care of the Hajjaj. So we see the Prophet ﷺ learning this from a young age, learning how to take care of others, and preferring others to himself. Now one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ, at that young age, uh, his mother Amina took him to Medina Manawara to visit, and some ulama say that it was to visit her extended family, who were living in Medina. Others say that uh, it was all that, uh, plus they, she wanted him to visit the grave of her, his father, Abdullah, that was in Medina, remember when Abdullah was going uh, on his journey to Damascus, to the Syria, to Sham, and he passed away on the way back in Medina Manawara. So they wanted to visit the grave of the father of, Abdu, of Abdullah. So anyways, regardless of the case, the Prophet ﷺ went with his mother at a young age, he was probably around, um, he was around uh, six years old at that time. He goes to Medina Manawara and he stays there for about a month. And some of the reports that are re reported about his stay there, he was passing by, for example, he was passing by uh, one of the houses and he remembered he had a flashback of his childhood. And he said that this house, it was from the house of Banu Adi ibn Najjar, and uh, near uh, Masjid Quba, probably most likely near that area, uh, where the extended family of Prophet was living. And he remembered the house, he said, this is the house where me and my mother stayed in when I was a young boy. And he also saw like there was like a pond, or it was a well, and he said, this is where I learned how to swim. So we know that in Makkah, the Prophet ﷺ, there's no wells, there's no wells in Makkah other than Zamzam, but there's no bodies of water, there's no wells, nothing like that. So the Prophet ﷺ actually, during his one month stay in Medina Manawara as a child, that's actually where he learned with other children, he learned how to swim. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, actually, sorry, Umar bin Khattab Radhan is reported to have written a letter and in this letter he says, That teach your children three things. And these are, Sabaha uh, meaning how to swim, Rami uh, meaning how to shoot an arrow, and Furusiya, how to ride a horse, horseback riding, or being a knight, basically being a horseback rider. So these are three things that it's from the Sunnah that we should ourselves know and learn, and we should teach our ch children, inshallah ta'ala. So Rasulullah as he's visiting, uh, as he's with his mother, visiting the grave of his father, visiting the extended family in Medina Manora, uh, on the return journey as they're heading back to Mecca, they stop at a place uh, called Abwa, and the mother had already si showed signs of getting sick. She started uh, feeling ill. And in this place of Abwa, that is actually the site where she passed away. This is a place in between uh, Medina and Mecca. If you go the other route, if you go the route of Badr, and you go down the old Hijra route, you go there, and, and Abwa comes on the way. So the Prophet Sallallahu mother passes away. This young boy, six years old, he watches horrified as his mother takes her last breaths. And there's a report, it it's, could be weak, um, but the mother, as she was passing away, her last words were to the Prophet ﷺ saying, كُلُّ حَيٍّ مَيِّتْ وَكُلُّ جَدِيدٍ بَالْ وَكُلُّ كَبِيرٍ يَفْنَى وَأَنَا مَيِّتَ وَذِكْرِ بَاقْ وَقَدْ تَرَكْتُ خَيْرًا وَوَلَدْتُ تُهْرًا she says this as she's passing away, that everything that is alive will die one day. Everything that is living will die one day, and everything that's new will become old. And every great thing, it passes away, it goes away. 
وَأَنَا مَيِّتَ And that I will pass away and I am dying. She's saying, I am dying. وَذِكْرِي بَاقْ But my remembrance meaning, you will remember me. You will remember me in your heart. وَقَدْ تَرَكْتُ خَيْرًا And I have left خَيْر I have left good, goodness. وَوَلَدْتُ تُخْرًا And I have given birth to something that is pure. So she says this, and as she says her last words, the Prophet saw him clinging onto the, uh, his, the body of his mother, hugging her as he's crying over her. And this, just imagine a young child, six years old, and this is the first instance, first occurrence of death. His first time that he ever faced death. He never saw anybody else die before, especially his mother or someone at that, that close to him. So he experiences this at, a year, uh, at six years old, and one of the things this teacher that the ulama tells us is this is a tarbiyah. This is the tarbiyah that he was going through. Ever since, before he was born actually, the tarbiyah started before he was born. The Prophet's father uh, passed away, so the Prophet was born as an orphan. That's part of his tarbiyah. Then when he grows older, his mother at six years old, he watches his mother pass away in front of him. That's also a tarbiyah. So you see this, this tarbiyah for compassion, for love, for you know, for this these kind of things, emotional intelligence they call it, uh, emotional intelligence that where the Prophet he learned this from, was from these incidents, <clears throat> and we see from this, for example, yeah, he learned the compassion for the ayatam, for the yatam, for the for the um, yatim, for the for the orphan ch- children, and the love that he had. For example, in one of the hadith, the Prophet says that ana. The, the, uh, the me and the kafil al yatim, the one who, the, who takes care of a yatim, are going to be like these two fingers. Meaning, on the day of judgment, we'll be together on the day of judgment. Also, the Prophet, for example, his emotional challenge is one of the examples. There was a Sahabi, young sh- Sahabi by the name of Bashir ibn Talha, عن, and one of the battles, his father had passed away. He was shaheed, he was martyred in one of the battles. The Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba are coming back into Medina. And as they're riding into Medina, Bashir is standing, either like he's climbed up a tree or he's on some place, looking for his father, looking at the faces of those who were returning. And as he sees the Prophet ﷺ, the last of those returning, because the Prophet ﷺ would be at the back of the army, he comes in and Bashir is crying because he realizes, my father has, is not returning. He passed away. And the Prophet seeing this young child crying and realizing that he's looking for his father, he immediately gets off his camel or his horse and he lifts this child, Bashir, and he hugs him and he says to him, that, Amma Tarda, do you not, are you not happy that I will be your father and my wife Aisha anha, will be your mother? So he takes care of these children. He sees this, this is the, all from that tarbiyah that he was getting as a child. Now one of the things that um, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was traveling back with his mother, he wasn't alone, there was a third person with him, and that was Baraka. That was Baraka, the, a woman by the name of Baraka ibn uh, Tha'laba. Baraka bint Tha'laba, radiallahu anha, and her nickname is Um Ayman. So Rasulullah ﷺ actually inherited her from his father. So she was a slave of his father Abdullah. And when Abdullah passed away, Rasulullah inherited her, uh, this uh, Baraka, as a slave. And after that, when the Prophet grew older and he married Khadija anha at the age of 25, he actually freed her. And he, uh, she married a person named Ubaid ibn Harith al-Khazarji, who married her and they had a child named Ayman. That's where she got her nickname, Um Ayman. And this Ayman actually was martyred in the Battle of Hunayn. So, we see this Um Ayman, this Baraka ibn Thalaba radiallahu uh, anha, some of the merits about her. For example, the Prophet ﷺ in one of the hadith, he says, Man sarrahu an yatazawwaja imra'atan min ahli jannah, min, min ahli jannah, fal yatazawwaj Um Ayman. That if someone is pleased to marry one of the people of Jannah, for one of the women of Jannah, then that person should marry Um Ayman. And Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anha, he took this opportunity and he asked the Prophet I would like to marry her and he was wed to Baraka bin Thalaba Um Ayman anha. So uh, Zayd bin Haritha anha, married her and they had a son named Usama bin Zayd and Usama anha, was the famous uh, young boy at the time of the Prophet anha, who they called him the Mahbub, the son of the Mahbub. So he was the beloved of Rasulullah the son of the beloved of the Prophet meaning Zayd ibn Haritha. So one of the things about Umm Ayman also to mention before you go on, Ibn Sa'd, 
uh, mentions this uh, miracle that happened in the Hijrah of Umm Ayman. Umm Ayman, anha, when she was making Hijrah to Medina Manora, she got to a point where it's called Roha. This is a place, it's a Bir Roha, it's in between Badr and Medina Manora. And uh, this is also the well that it's famously uh, it's mentioned that about 70 Anbiya drank from this well. And this is also the well where the Prophet in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, before they, when they were going for Umrah, they were going for Hudaybiyah. Uh, on the way, they stopped at this well and the water diminished, the water finished. And there was only like droplets of water left in this well of Roha. And the Prophet the Sahaba came to the Prophet and they, they complained. They said that the water is done. We don't have water for wudu. We don't have water to drink. The Prophet asked them, take an arrow and they stuck it into the ground at the bottom of the well also the prophet took his blessed luab his his um his saliva and put it in the droplets of the of the well and the water gushed forward it came up and it was enough and it's still flowing to the, today you see thousands of people go to that well and they take from that well and they drink from it and they take it even to their countries so um ayman stopped at this area close to that beer close to that well. She wasn't at the well, she was close to that. And she, uh, she was fasting and she ran out of water. And at night when it was time to break her fast, she had nothing to drink. And remember, imagine she's a woman, she's old, she was really old at that time too. She's traveling through the desert. She didn't have anything to drink. She almost died because of the thirst. And they say that uh, a bucket of water came down from the sky. This is a miracle that happened. A bucket of water came down from the sky and Umm Ayman drank from that. And she said, I, after that day, I never felt any thirst ever again in my life. Now, also the Prophet uh, in regards to Umm Ayman, he would mention about her. He would say, Ummi, uh, umma, sorry, sorry, he would say, Umm Ayman, Ummi, Ba'd Ummi. Meaning that Umm Ayman is my mother after my mother. Meaning that after the Prophet's mother had passed away, Umm Ayman was the one who took him and traveled back with him to Medina Manawara. And she was the one who would take care of him. And she was also a wet nurse of the Prophet. So she took care of the Prophet, uh, you know, since before he, uh, when he was born, uh, since he was born until later on when uh, he grew up. And Rasulullah one thing also to mention is that years later, as the Prophet with the Sahaba, they're passing by the area of Abwa. And when they pass by, the Prophet tells the Sahaba that you guys wait here. And a few of them, just a few of them accompany him. They go forward to this area. And even now until today, there's no inhabitants in the area. There's nothing there. So it's really difficult to find the grave of Amina. But the Prophet he knew exactly where it was. He goes to the grave of his mother and he sits down and he starts to cry. He's hugging the grave of his mother and he's crying. He's crying so much that the Sahaba, they're becoming worried and they didn't know what's going on. They didn't know that this is the grave of the mother. So they asked the Prophet, what is it that, why, is our, why are you crying? You know, let us know so we can cry with you. And this is one of the things, you know, when, you, when someone you love cries, just seeing them cry will bring tears to your heart. And so they saw the Prophet doing this, they started crying with him. And then the Prophet mentioned and told them that this is the grave of my mother. And I asked Allah subhanahu wa for permission to visit my mother's grave and it was granted to me. And Rasulullah says, I miss my mother. So he visited his, this is the grave years later. Uh, going back, now the Prophet young Muhammad at the age of six years old, he gets into the custody of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. He has no one left. One by one, his mother, his father passed away before he was born. Now his mother passes away when he's six years old, and his grandfather takes care of him. Now, one of the things that is mentioned uh, is not really mentioned too often, but the grandmother of Rasulullah Sallam, her name was. Anybody know her name? She's not really mentioned in the books too much, but the grandmother of Rasulullah Sallam, the wife of Abdul Muttalib, his her name was Fatima. And one of the things is that Rasulullah must have had some kind of connection, great connection with his grandmother, the one who took care of him after his mother. So she was like another mother to him. That she, He actually named his daughter after his grand, grandmother. So Fatima, uh, the grandfather, grandmother of Rasulullah also took, took care of him. 
And you can just imagine the love between the grandfather and grandmother and their grandson, the one that they've seen that he's an orphan boy. Their son passed away before he was born, and now the daughter-in-law has passed away. So, you know, they had this immense love for him. And one of the things, for example, is mentioned is that uh, Abdul Muttalib, he had a special spot and mattress that they would put out for him. So it was in the shade of the Kaaba. So Abdul Muttalib, whenever he would come out to um, sit and, and you know, have his meetings, he would sit in the shade of the Kaaba and they would put out this mattress for him where he would, <coughs> excuse me, he would sit down on this mattress and he would meet the delegations, he would meet the tribal leaders, he would make decisions on this mattress. And one of the things that no one would dare to sit on that mattress except Abdul Muttalib. No one was allowed to sit. But the Prophet ﷺ, this young boy, uh, around, you know, you know, he could say even before his mother had passed away, uh, up, to, up to eight years old, uh, between those ages, he's coming and he's sneaking onto the mattress and he would sit on the mattress. And the, the uncles of Rasulullah would try to, you know, stop him, like tell him, you know, get away, just move away. This is the, our father's seat, you're not supposed to be sitting here. But Abdul Muttalib, when he would see them do this, he would yell at them and say to them that, leave him, khalli, utruk, leave him. And uh, in uh, lihada ibni, that for this son of mine, la shan. That I, I know, I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this son of mine has some uh, bright future or has some special favor from Allah, so has a special position. So he would say this and he would actually sit down and he would allow young Muhammad وسلم, to sit with him on his lap or sit on the mattress with him. And also this tells us the, the tarbiyah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting the Prophet وسلم, through. At this young age, he's sitting there with his grandfather as the delegation is coming in and they're meeting the uh, Abdul Muttalib, the, the leader of the Quraysh. And Rasulullah وسلم, this young boy, is watching this and listening and he's observing how his grandfather deals with them, how he talks to them. And this was part of the tarbiyah that made him the great leader that he became. Now, Rasulullah Wasallam, yet another setback or another difficulty or test that comes in his life is that when he's about eight years old, his only father figure at that time or only father figure that he had throughout his life up to that point, Abdul Muttalib passes away. So his grandfather Abdul Muttalib also passes away and this was a great sadness. Um Ayman anha, again she narrates, she says that I saw the funeral procession of the Abdul Muttalib going forward and I saw young Muhammad وسلم, this young boy, eight years old boy, following the funeral procession crying profusely. He's crying and weeping because of his love he had for his grandfather. And inshallah I'm gonna end with this inshallah that we, we know that Rasulullah he tells us uh, in one of the hadith, and this is actually one of the common things throughout the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, from childhood all the way to his, his death. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ went through difficulties and trials and tribulations all through, uh, throughout his life. This is the one common thing we see throughout his life. And one of the things is that the Prophet ﷺ went through these is to teach us as an ummah that whatever difficulties we face, it's nothing compared to the difficulties that the Prophet ﷺ faced. It should give us some kind of tasalli, it should give us tasliya, that we should feel con consoled that the, the, the trials and tri the tests that the Prophet ﷺ, the tribulations the Prophet ﷺ went through, the, our difficulties are nothing compared to that. And we see in one of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was asked by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he says, قُلْ تُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَيُّ النَّاسِ أَشَدُّ بَلَا that O oh, Rasulullah which of the people, which of the people are tested the most? And Rasulullah responds by saying, Al Ambiya, the Prophets. And then he goes on to say, Thumma al Amthal, Thumma al Fal Amthal. So Thumma al Amthal, Fal Amthal, meaning that after the Ambiya, then the closest to the meaning, the closest in rank, those that are closest to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in uh, in terms of taqwa, in piety, in faith, in iman, in tawakkul. Those are tested the most. Most. rajul ala hasbi dini. So a person is tested according to the the deen and faith that that person has. For in kana dinu sulban ishtad bala That if the person's deen and his faith is strong, then his difficulties, his tests, 
become stronger and, and more difficult. When kana fi dinihi riqqatun ibtuliya ala hasabi dini. And also if he has some softness or he's a little bit weak, then his tests are weak in that sense. فَمَا يَبْرَحُ الْبَلَاءُ بِالْعَبْدِ حَتَّى يَتْرُكَهُ يَمْشِي عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مَا عَلَيْهِ خَطِيئَ and the Prophet goes on to say that the person is not tested and tried in this world except that he goes and he's walking on this earth without any sin. Meaning his sins are being forgiven whenever a person goes through any trial. So this is something to remind us that whenever we go into, through any difficulty, we should remember this hadith of the Prophet Remember that this is tahur. This is something that Allah SWT is using to clean, clean our, cleanse us and clean us from our sins before we meet him inshallah ta'ala. And also another hadith I'd like to end with inshallah is the Prophet SAW reports, this is Imam Muslim rahimahullah reports this hadith, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ And the Prophet SAW says that it's amazing the, the affair of a believer, that verily his affair, whatever it is, is good for him. وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ لِأَحْدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ And that is nothing, that this, this, this uh, situation is not, is not for anybody except for a mu'min. إِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ سَرَّا شَكَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهِ So if something, uh, if something good happens, a good, uh, like if Allah SWT uh, tests that person with good, with something khair, and that person does shukr, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is good for him. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ الضَّرَّةِ صَبَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهِ And if something, uh, a test or difficulty comes the person's way, and that person has sabr and is patient, then that is also good for him. So whatever happens in our life, whatever we're tested with good or bad, seemingly to in our eyes good or bad, it is khair for us. Depending on how we react, we have to have between shukr and sabr, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll get the ajr for that. So inshallah I'll stop there. Subhanallah bika rabbil izati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillah.